Well, I think I will go ahead and get us started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today, Black Health Trust. Glad you all could join us, and I'd like to turn the program over to our founder, Dr. Randall Maxick. Good afternoon, Dr. Walks and Dr. Hines and Simon and all those who have joined us today. Uh, we're going to talk about stroke. Uh, we've talked about it before, but as Dr. Walks told me earlier, people are still having them, so it's something very relevant. And uh, we'll entertain questions and answers after the talk, and we'll start. Uh, I want to just announce that one of our preeminent pastors and civil rights advocates in Los Angeles passed the other day, uh, Reverend Dr. Chip Murray, the pastor of First Amy Church, and he was a, a great, great leader and friend and man, and we do mourn his passing. So it seems as the older I get, the more people I know that pass. I don't know what the psychology of that is, Dr. Walks. I don't know, Dr. Maxey, but you mentioned um, Reverend Murray. He was uh, a good friend of our family and actually read the scripture at my dad's Reverend Walks's funeral. So uh, Reverend Murray is uh, someone I've known for many, many years and much, much respect for the work that he's done really to transform that that community where he served for so long. Yeah, very good, very good. I didn't know you were a PK. <laughs> you can't tell? <laughs> okay, Simon, let's go with the first slides and start. Is it going to play, Simon? Looks like we're having a little technical difficulty a minute. If we get the wrong thing up, it'll be up in just a minute. So one of the things from what was just shown, Dr. Maxey, it's just um, I, every time we talk about one of these uh, conditions, there's always that part that we that we read that um, 
talks about how it impacts the black community um, in a way that is profound. And um, another reason for us to talk about it again. That's true, thank you. And just to add to that point, I think um, in addition to the fact that you know it stays relevant, there is still that space where people don't um, recognize or acknowledge some of the uh, symptoms of a stroke. And that's so critical in the context of trying to get um, care or treatment for a, a new or acute stroke. There, there are some, at, sometimes there is something that can be done um, if we act fast. And it's, and it's very common for people to want to, oh, I woke up with these weird symptoms, right? And then, oh, what if, if I lay down and I'll, right. I'll go back to my room and lay down and take a nap and then maybe it'll be better or I'll just sit here and, you know, give it some time. And sometimes that precious time is the difference between something that we can act upon and something yeah. we can't. You know, and, uh, I invite my co-moderators, uh, as we usually do, to comment on the information that we present, and then we'll look at some of the other subjects. Yeah, Dr. Hall, you want to take us So stroke is a very important topic, both in terms of public health, and I'll have to say, and also personally. So let's go to the next slide, please. So heart disease is one of the leading causes along with stroke of mortality and morbidity in the United States. There are seven rules of life. Next slide. And this could encompass the whole talk Stop smoking if you do, eat better if you don't, get active if you are not, lose weight if you need to, manage blood pressure, and control your cholesterol and reduce your blood sugar. And up to the weight thing, we know that there are cultural differences in weight, and we know that some 80 plus percent of black females are obese and probably only a slightly lesser number of black males that are obese. And it's not because of so-called big bones that we don't eat correctly. Next slide. So stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in America. Uh, when the blood that brings oxygen to the brain stops flowing, brain cells die. On the average, someone in the United States has a stroke every 40 seconds. Black Americans have a higher prevalence of stroke and the highest death rate from stroke than any other racial group. Eating too much salt, which is sodium, research does show that African Americans may have a gene that greatly exacerbates our sensitivity to salt and its effects. Next slide. So stroke reduction. So since stroke is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in North America, we know that primary prevention of stroke includes lifestyle modification and measures to control blood pressure, cholesterol, Cholesterol levels have to be controlled. Diabetes mellitus, if you have it, needs to be controlled. Blood sugar, even if you're not diabetic, needs to be controlled. And there's a condition of the heart beating too fast called atrial fibrillation that needs to be identified and if found, controlled. But lowering blood pressure in patients with hypertension is significantly important in both types of strokes. There's one kind of stroke called a hemorrhagic stroke, which is a blood vessel bursting and bleeding in the brain, and the other is called an ischemic stroke, where a blood vessel becomes blocked. But treating these two types by lowering your blood pressure 
and keeping your cholesterol and glucose under control can reduce strokes by 30 to 45 percent. Next slide. So what is a stroke? A stroke is sometimes called a brain attack. It occurs when something blocks a blood supply to a part of the brain or when a blood vessel in the brain bursts. In either case, parts of the brain are damaged or die. A stroke can be a lasting brain, can cause lasting brain damage, can cause long-term disability, and it can even cause death. Next slide. In this uh, set of cartoons, on the left, you see a blocked artery. And in that blocked artery, the area of the brain below the blockage can die. It's called necrosis. It's called an infarct. And that is a uh, type of stroke that can be quite damaging. It can typically be caused by either a blood clot being there, or it can be when a blood vessel is blocked by plaque, which is high lipids in some cases. Uh, and it can even be temporarily blocked for less than 36 hours, and then it's called a TIA, or a transient ischemic attack. Number two is a ruptured artery, which has caused a bleeding stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, and it shows that below the area of the bleeding that you also have necrosis of brain cells. Next slide. So there are risk factors. The higher levels of cholesterol are associated with an increased risk of ischemic stroke. You know, we used to call it uh, hardening of the arteries. It's atherosclerosis, it's plaque, because anything that can narrow the lumen in the blood vessel leading to areas of the brain. If you have high cholesterol, you should be treated with statins or some other agent that can reduce the risk of having high cholesterol. There is a lot of controversy over, or I don't want to take statins, but sometimes those statins can save your life and can reduce fatal strokes and non-fatal strokes by up to 25%. But pairing glucose control with stroke reduction and aggressive treatment of hypertension and hyperlipidemia in patients with diabetes mellitus is recommended. There was a study done uh, some years ago showing that if you have diabetes and you have to control both glucose and blood pressure, it is more important, even though they're both important, that you control your blood pressure aggressively. There's more life-saving events with control of blood pressure. Next slide. So strokes can happen to anyone, but they tend to be more common in older men, black people, and Asian people. So reducing your risk to stroke or for stroke includes avoiding tobacco use, taking care of high cholesterol levels, get rid of that fried chicken and ribs, and also having an active lifestyle. Next slide. Uh, get your blood pressure checked regularly. That's very important to do that. Uh, we have a, a, a project right now called uh, RPM, Remote Patient Monitoring, where we can provide uh, people with blood pressure monitors, scales, glucometers, and oximeters, but we can track, collect that information and provide you with information on how to keep your blood pressure under control remotely. Uh, you should avoid smoke and avoid people who smoke and don't allow smoking in your house because secondhand smoke is sometimes more dangerous than firsthand smoke. Eat less fat, fatty foods. Have your cholesterol levels checked regularly by your family doctor. Exercise regularly, at least 30 minutes on most days of the week. Keep your weight under control. If you have diabetes, control your blood sugar. If you don't have diabetes, control your blood sugar. And that uh, example I've given before about creme brulee, 
where your high blood sugar gets converted by your normal body temperature into a plastic-like spicule that goes into your blood vessel and can cause plaques and blood vessel damage. Next slide. Dr. Max, so, yes. Dr. Max, there has been a question asked about cholesterol. How do you know that your cholesterol is high and what is HDL and LDL? Okay, so the way you know your cholesterol is high, in a normal sense, you have to have your blood drawn and your doctor will order something called a lipid panel. And that lipid panel there are several sets of elements that we will talk about. One is your total cholesterol, which should normally be below 200 milligrams per cent. Then there is your good cholesterol, which is HDL, and HDL should be above 70 percent, and HDL helps get rid of your bad cholesterol. Your bad cholesterol is called LDL and LDL needs to be less than 100 milligrams per cent. And then you, they are your triglycerides. And we'll, we can discuss some of those as we go on. But you can't find out your cholesterol unless you uh, have your blood drawn, unless you have severe elevated cholesterol, in which case you form these little things that turn up at the corners of your eyelids, et cetera, called atheroma. And uh, that's when you're really out of control, when you have fat deposits in your uh, epidermal tissue. And we can talk about those as we go later. Uh, now, we none of us like to take medicine, but if your exercise and your diet control are not taking care of your high blood pressure, your high glucose or your cholesterol, you may have to take medicine. And that's what your medical provider or your physician can prescribe for you. And I, I do ascribe to the fact that you may have to take medicine. You may not have to take it lifelong, but you might need to take that medicine until you get under control where diet and exercise can adequately control it. So if you do have high blood pressure and diet doesn't control it, you need medication. Now I give some personal recommendations that many, uh, there are many, many types of blood pressure medicine. I advocate that the type of blood medication, that blood pressure medication taken by African Americans not be so-called ACE inhibitors, because one, they weren't researched on people of color. There's also more allergic reactions. And I think it's better to use something called an angiotensin receptor blocking agent, usually drugs that end in the word sartin. And they help also lower the uh, effects of high blood pressure on your kidney by reducing pressure inside the glomerulus. There are also medicines called calcium channel blockers. And the one type of medicine that I advise against in most cases as a first line drug is something called beta blockers. And we can talk about that later. And I have some interesting personal experience with some of these. Uh, we know there's controversy about anti-cholesterol medication, but if you need it, it might be good to temporarily take it. Uh, uh, Doctor, also Dr. Maxey, I hate to, to interrupt, but you've mentioned high blood pressure and lowering your blood pressure several times. And um, for some of the psychiatrists uh, on the call, can you tell us what a normal blood pressure is and yes. what it means when you say high blood pressure? What are those numbers? It's 120 over 80, and I've got a slide just for you in a few okay, minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, so it's important to know that sometimes people need to take blood thinners it was recommended years ago that people take 81 milligrams of aspirin a day. That's good for some people, but there are risks involved. So make sure you have an idea from your doctor or provider whether that's something that's good for you. And it also has an effect in some people on helping to lower the risk of uh, colon cancer. Next slide. Could I just... Uh underline what you just said about consulting your physician about whether or not you are a candidate to take um, aspirin therapy. The uh, guidelines on that just in the last couple of months have been changed and it is no longer recommended that um, people 60 and older take aspirin for uh, prevention of problems. And it is again, really important that you discuss with your physician uh, whether or not 
if you're younger than 60, whether or not you should or are a candidate to take aspirin. Don't just go to the store and start popping pills. Right. And there are other advantages of aspirin other than just high blood pressure and stroke, et cetera. But that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. But you're exactly right. So antithrombotic therapy and antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulant therapy. And I won't spend any time on that, but that's something you're only going to talk about with your doctor anyway. Next slide. So you're going to see me talk about high blood pressure much on this thing. High blood pressure is the big silent killer and it affects a lot of us. And you don't know if you have it or not in most cases. Diabetes is the other one. And heavy alcohol use is probably not that prominent on the audience that we have on this call. But the drinks that you have are very important not to over drink. And nobody should be drinking a fifth of liquor uh, per night. And I was always taught that whatever a patient tells you that they drink, multiply it by five. Next slide. Is that right, Dr. Walks? <laughs> I, I don't think that's an absolute, Dr. Maxey, but I think with some people, you may want to do that. So I, I had this slide specifically for you, and I put a note to myself to have Dr. Walks navigate this slide verbally for us. Oh, I am, I'm, I'm happy because reading is fundamental, Dr. Maxey. Thank so you. So this slide, do you have high blood pressure, or how do you know if you have high blood pressure? Well, blood pressure categories we have on the left, and then the the upper number the systolic number we have and blood pressure always comes in two numbers people will say something to me like well you know my blood pressure is 100 uh, no it's not your blood pressure is always two numbers and so when we when we're looking at um at this slide it tells us normal blood pressure the top number is less than 120 and the bottom number is less than 80. so dr maxi mentioned earlier normal blood pressure 120 over 80 great then we have elevated and high and thank you dr maxi for making this slide easy for me because i can tell this is like one of those weather reports when the color gets down from orange and red it's time to get in the basement and so with this slide it's time to run to your doctor and there are actually um stages in this where it says consult immediately so elevated blood pressure 120 to 129, but still the bottom number is less than 80. High blood pressure, both the upper number and the lower number are high. Uh, 130 to 139, 80 to 89 on the lower number. And then we get into the, this is some real concern. High blood pressure, stage two, 140 or higher is that upper number, and 90 or higher is the lower number. And then hypertensive crisis where you've got to really get some help quickly. Upper number is higher than 180 and lower number is higher than 120. This is a great slide, Dr. Maxey. It's very clear, but when I just get off the treadmill, is that the time that I take my blood pressure? I've just finished doing my four miles and I'm sweating and I'm breathing really hard. My heart rate is up and I'm feeling really healthy that's not when I take my blood pressure and look at these numbers, right? No, but let's talk about that. That is an excellent time to know what that blood pressure is after you get off that treadmill because your blood pressure is evanescent. It is meaning that it does not just stay 120 or 80, even if you're, you're perfect. Your blood pressure is going to go up and down with emotion, with activity, et cetera. The way I check blood pressure, I have a person walk in place for two minutes in my office and if that blood pressure exceeds that level the second level where it says elevated then i know that they're not properly controlled after you exercise after you walk your blood pressure should not significantly go above that elevated level it should not do that you need to be controlled much more than that and the only way to tell is to challenge the blood pressure so you can be be sleeping in the bed and your blood pressure is 120 over 80 but if you walk to the kitchen you eat that bacon and it jumps up to 130 over 139 that's high that means you're not controlled so you have to take your blood pressure maybe not exactly after you get off the treadmill but within 10 to 15 minutes after it should return to normal if that answers your question 
So, so, so let me let, let me let me just be be clear, Dr. Maxey. So, no matter what I've I've been doing, if I sit down for about ten to fifteen minutes, my blood pressure should go back down to these levels. Yes. Okay. Okay, because if not, imagine that what your blood pressure is doing when it's higher than that, it's like hitting your head against a wall softly at 130, uh, 130 millimeters of mercury per minute. That will give you a severe headache. That can burst a, a, a blood vessel. That can exacerbate the release of a plaque. So that blood pressure is very important to con be controlled most of the time. It won't be controlled all of the time, but the majority of the time it should not go above that elevated level. Let's go to the next slide, Simon, if you would. Atrial fibrillation uh, is something that your doctor will tell you if you have, but if you feel abnormal heartbeats, for example, I uh, when I do a pulse, if your pulse rate is 130, 140, if I hear abnormal beats, uh, I'm going to do an EKG. But ask your doctor, if you feel your heart flipping and flopping in your chest, you need to be checked with an electrocardiogram. Let's go to the next slide. And we'll talk about extracranial, but many people have strokes related uh, to what's going on in the carotid artery. That's a big artery in your neck where you can feel your pulse in your neck. And some people have stenosis. When your doctor examines you, not only should they listen to your heart, but they should listen to your carotid because sometimes you can hear a murmur uh, there or sounds there that would indicate that you have carotid plaques. And the way you test that is with a Doppler or an ultrasound. And that's something your doctor can do, and you should do that. Next slide. Uh, intracranial stenosis, uh, you're only going to find out if you have an MRI or MRA, and that would be a, a test that your doctor can order, and the appropriate therapy will be ordered from that. Next slide. So there are several studies that evaluate secondary stroke prevention. Uh, and there are some people who don't have, there's usually when you're born, there's a hole in the heart between the two atria, called the formal valley. And normally that closes after the first four breaths or so. Is that right, Dr. Barber? The first four breaths that you have, it closes? It should. Okay, but in many cases, some cases it does not. And you'll find some adults who have persistence of that into uh, adulthood and sometimes it's found and it can be closed uh, percutaneously. But again, uh, you can find that out when your doctor does an evaluation, uh, usually with a, a 2D echocardiogram or a color flow study of that. Next slide. So Dr. Um, again, Dr. Maxey, so just to just to clarify, the foramen valley is an opening that connects the two sides of the heart that we don't need after the baby is born. Is that Correct. fair to say in layman's terms? Correct. And if I'm right, then I'll refer this, defer to Dr. Barber that in utero, this allows the baby to have directly high oxygenated blood to the brain uh, in utero. But after you're born, you don't need that. Any comments on that, doctor? That is exactly right. And if things go the way they're supposed to go with those first breaths, the heart is the signal is given and it's supposed to close. But a lot so, of times it doesn't. So it's having a common finding actually. So having a healthy baby is a miracle, I'll tell you. Uh, patients with it embolic knows, nature knows what it's what it's doing. Okay. I think nature's name is also G O D. Uh, patient with embolic stroke, which is a stroke from blood clots of uncertain source, should not just be willy nilly put on an anticoagulant. Uh, and also when you go to an emergency room with a stroke, which we'll talk about a little bit, you have to be careful about whether or not you want to receive the uh, clot bluster. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go to the next slide. So what are the signs of a stroke? If you see facial drooping or experience facial drooping, if there's sudden numbness of the face, one side or the other, 
or unilateral meaning on one side of, of the hands or arms or legs of numbness. Uh, if you have arm or leg weakness, uh, if there's speech problems or even understanding problems with comprehension, that's sudden and onset or sudden onset of lack of balance, uh, lightheadedness or dizziness, it could potentially be a stroke. Next slide. So in those cases, you want to call 911. If someone shows any of those symptoms, even if they go away. So she had it at eight in the morning, she ate some breakfast and it all went away. Call 911 still. And try to get the exact time that the symptoms were first noted. So when you go to the emergency room, you know when the symptoms happen because there's a, a clock ticking, there's a time limit in which you can be offered a, a clot buster. Uh, and I believe that window is about five to six hours at most. And sometimes that can be life changing if you get the clot buster. I'm, I'm not using the appropriate pharmacological name, uh, but it does uh, save lives if it can reduce that clot. But there are also risk was taken. And you must ask that radiologist, they have specific radiologists who read those and, and make them tell you if you have a risk, what is the possibility that the blood clot uh, buster will work and provide you with uh, uh, relief? And what is the specific risk if it doesn't? And what is the percentage? Compare those two percentages. And I've seen uh, people go to the emergency room. They said, well, there's a uh, a 20% chance that it will make you better and a 40% chance that you will be worse, then the answer is no, I'm not taking it. But if it gives you the right uh, recipe of what the risks are, then you should consider taking it in consultation with the primary care doctor. There are five suddens that cover stroke warning signs, such as sudden numbness or weakness of the face, arm, leg, especially on one side of the body. Next slide. Next slide. If there's sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding, sudden trouble uh, seeing in one or both eyes, sudden trouble in walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination, sudden severe headache with uh, no known cause. If you think you or a family member may be having a stroke, call 911. Acting quickly can improve the chance of survival, improve the chance of recovery, and the doctor will do an exam and order tests including pictures of the brain and probably offer you if you've been in that five to six hour window of whether or not the clot busting injection will be of use to you. Next slide. So risk reduction, I, 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 term, I coined the term hero, health, education, risk reduction opportunities. And what we do here on Black Health Trust is HERO, Health Education and Risk Reduction Opportunity. The management of vascular risk factors remains extremely important in secondary stroke prevention, meaning if you've already had a stroke or a TIA, but it's not limited to that, but it's important in diabetes, smoking cessation, lipids, and especially high blood pressure, and intensive medical management is often performed. And this is important, it's not just giving people a brochure, but actually having a program that you attend to decrease your risk. Next, next slide. And I use that term demographic at the end of that sentence. Everybody is not at the same risk. Uh, we know that there are lifestyle factors, including healthy diet and physical activities. They're very important. We recommend a Mediterranean diet or a DASH diet recommended for stroke risk reduction. Uh, there's a product called Mrs. DASH and as diet to uh, uh, lower the risk reduction, it, it substitutes for salt without having any sodium in it. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Maxa, you mean the Mrs. Dash seasoning that you can just buy in the grocery store, right? Yep, and they have all sorts of flavors. They have garlic and they have regular, and I have it on, I have it on my table. And it's, and it's right in there next to the regular salt and the seasoning salt and all that. I think so. I haven't been shopping for a while, but I think that's where it is, but it's delivered in my house. So changing patient behaviors such as diet, and that is so difficult for a lot of us, including me, that we have to look at this diet, we have to look at exercise, and I almost call this lecture the beat up. 
because I'm repeating so many things that are so important that a lot of this can be handled by diet and exercise alone and not all necessarily fancy medica medication. Next slide. So there's some, some nu nutritional suggestions and I, I got this from uh, nutritionists that I work with to limit your total carbs to 30 grams or less per meal. Increase fiber to 25 grams per day for female to 40 grams if you're a male. Avoid processed and refined foods. Center meals around three to four ounces servings of protein. Dr. Cutter a few weeks ago in her talk on nutrition said we should use uh, our meat, our fish and protein as a condiment and not the main part of the meal. So don't build a meal around the steak or the fish, make those the condiments. Um, eat one starch a day, fresh fruits at least once per day, vegetables at least two with dinner or lunch, fresh salads three to five times a week, choose organic produce, grass-fed meats, wild-caught salmon, pasture-raised chickens and eggs. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Maxey, before you leave this slide, can you just say uh, starch is, is uh, uh, potato? What it, tell us about what a starch is quickly. Starch is potato. It's uh, pasta. Uh, it's uh, what they call long chain, branch chain uh, carbohydrates. But there are things. Uh, bread. And bread. And, bread. Bread. And, 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 and those of us with the, with the Caribbean background, you trying to limit our rice also? Oh, yeah. man. I'm right. just saying, I'm asking yeah, you're, these you're, questions. You're right. So so I'm in a Jamaican household, mm -hmm. and rice is a part of every meal. At least they try to get it. At least they made it brown rice now. <laughs> but you're so, very right. so, so, so all the things that you just listed, I, I just I just want to be clear. So the rice, the pasta, the potatoes, all of that stuff we have to pay attention to. And the grits. And the starch. And the grits. No, no, we're, we're going ex to exclude grits. That's, you can't get rid of grits. <laughs> Next slide. No, grits should be out. Next slide. So everything that's good to you should be out. Uh, there's, you should, this is, get rid of, go to the next slide from this. So RWM, that's Randall W. Maxi Gourmet uh, comments. Uh, roasting vegetables on high heat will sometimes caramelize them and reduce the bitterness, but you don't want to caramelize them too much. Uh, that has some effects on possibly being carcinogenic. Grilled fruits will unlock deeper sweetness. Uh, marinating mushrooms and other vegetables in low calorie salad dressing, like Italian dressing, uh, uh, lemon garlic dressing for grilling is also excellent and healthy. And my dinner tonight is going to be mostly vegetables and a little bit of fish as a condiment. Next slide. Uh, uh, Dr. Maxi, before you leave this slide, you mentioned low calorie salad dressing. So many times folks will think they're eating a healthy salad and they've just poured 500 cal uh, calories of salad dressing on it. Well, I should put a limited amount. Oh, well, you know, th there is no excuse for that because salad dressings are very simple to make yourself. And you can certainly make a low calorie Italian with a little vinegar and a little olive oil and some Italian seasoning and you won't have your carbs. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to get back to making stuff ourselves. Mm. And, and, and Ivan, I don't know if you got the invitation, but I got invited to Tampa, Florida to have personal meals made by the famous Dr. Neighbor. Next slide. I did not get invited. I'm very sad right now. So oils you should cook with. They should be oils that don't oxidize when they're heated, such as avocado oil and coconut oil. Olive oil is good for salads, but not for heating and cooking. Next slide. Shouldn't be frying that much anyway. <laughs> uh, so exercise is key to most things in life, but you don't have to exercise for two hours like Dr. Walks does. You can break that up into 10 to 15 minute periods a day so you don't kill yourself and 
sweat up all your clothes so your wife has to take them to the laundry. You should quit smoking and to not be around people who smoke or let them in your house. And after 20 minutes of quitting smoking, already your blood sugar, your blood pressure starts to go down, your heart rate returns to normal. So you can see an immediate reduction when you stop smoking. Next slide. So getting enough rest makes you less likely to crave sugar, fatty foods that provide quick energy. You don't need to turn yourself into a pretzel to meditate, find positions that are comfortable. You don't have to be a guru or whatever the, those people who meditate in India. Just find a quiet corner and reduce your mental activity and pressure. A few minutes of meditation each day can create a positive influence on well-being. Is that true, Dr. Walks? That is true, Dr. Maxson. Good. And do not overlook your emotional and mental health if you need to manage stress, anxiety, depression, or grief. Sometimes you need to talk to somebody and let it out. Holding it in is not going to help at all. Being a strong, stiff upper lip, big he-man, big she-woman, you got to reduce that stress, reduce that grief. And if I'm right, most grief especially over death, is not about who died, but about how it affects you. So it's sort of selfish anyway. So we got to find a way to control it. Next slide. So that was a review of what we've talked about. We want to talk a little bit more about how dangerous stroke is. And it can, it can ruin not only the rest of your day, but the rest of your life. Your not, the rest of your life. So we want to be careful about stroking. The heating thing that we want to heat is make sure you move promptly. Is there anything in the chat or questions that, that we should address, Dr. Walks and Dr. Hines? While we are, are reviewing some of the comments in the chat, there is an acronym that I just want to bring to the group's attention. Uh, the acronym is FAST. Right. Um, and it is an acronym for stroke that is meant to address F would be if you have any facial drooping. The A is around arm weakness, but it could really be arm or leg weakness. And then the S is around speech changes, slurring of your words, difficulty finding words, that type of thing. And T is for time, meaning it's time to call uh, 911. So as as we talked earlier about, um, you know, some of the signs and some of the signs of a stroke, that's just an acronym that is used to help people remember um, w what some of those signs and symptoms are. You know, I'm, I see people every day that don't know their blood pressure and how it can affect them having a stroke. They don't know how they're eating. Their lack of exercise can affect having a stroke is a serious, serious problem, and it's integrally linked with heart disease as well. And I bring up the issue of atrial fibrillation, and we know that atrial fibrillation, if you have latent clots in your ventricles, they can be forwarded onto your, your brain. Do you have any experience with that, Dr. Hines, in the practice that you have? Um, as far as people having um, strokes related to clots in their heart, sure do, right? Um, but in, in that same vein, one of the things that we, we've we been talking about, too, in the awareness of stroke is around, you know, who can have a stroke? And I think in general, we've, we've discussed that not only are Black people more likely to have strokes, but we're more likely to have strokes at younger ages, roughly 10 years younger than the average white person. So the average white person is having, might have a stroke in their early 70s and the average African-American person might have one in their early 60s. And that is average. So the other thing I also wanted to point out in that space is around 30 and 40 year olds can have strokes too, right? So don't think that just because, you know, you're only 32, right? It can't be a stroke. It must be something else. Um, they actually do, you know, younger people and younger in the stroke space is considered anybody less than 50, um, do have strokes. And unfortunately, that is also the age group that is more likely to have 
a, a higher rate of death and a higher rate of uh, impairment um, due to their strokes. It could possibly be, uh, and I'm just speculating uh, at this point, it could possibly be because maybe the symptoms aren't recognized earlier in some in, in young people, both in the medical community as well as by the individual, because again, across the board, African Americans are less likely to receive some of the clot busting um, um, treatments that Dr. that Dr. Maxi mentioned. So those are like the gold standard treatments for strokes, and African Americans are less likely to receive those. And then younger people having strokes are also less likely um, to receive those as well. So I think. Um, it's really, really important to recognize uh, those symptoms. And when you do call 911, say, I think I'm having a stroke, right? Uh, that is critical uh, for several reasons because only certain facilities, and this is where I've had some of that experience that you're referring to, uh, Dr. Maxey, only certain facilities have uh, uh, the ability to treat um, strokes with those uh, drugs that you're re relating to. So that way the hospital or the ambulance or whatever knows to take you to uh, the right facility. The other thing too that has come up for me in this space is the temptation to drive yourself or to drive your loved one uh, to the hospital when they're having these symptoms and to drive yourself because right now it might just be your hand is weak. I could still drive. You don't know what's coming, right? You don't. You don't. You don't know what else might be developing. So resist the temptation um, to drive yourself, or and in many cases to drive your loved one. Because again, you don't know what's you don't know what's coming. Now we all know in our communities there are different rates of uh, of, uh, of when nine one one is going to show up. So I am I'm making. I'm making generalizations here, um, but th those are things sometimes that people do too, that it it's not necessarily in your best interest. Because again, you could drive yourself to a facility that can't help you. And as uh, Dr. Gibson wrote in the, in, the, in the comments there, time is tissue, right? So roughly if you have a blood clot in your brain, you're use losing about 2 million cells uh, per minute. A and that loss, of, that loss of cells is what's showing up uh, that the the death of those cells is what's showing up on the outside in that loss of speech and that loss of arm movement in that in that um, those changes that you're seeing. Excellent review. Any things uh, 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 Dr. Maxey, Dr. Uh, uh, Tolbert has a hand up. Please recognize her, Dr. Tolbert. Yes, it's me, uh, Alice Coombe. I just wanted to say that uh, I, I'm an intensivist in the neuroscience ICU. And so uh, interesting, in the last three years, uh, based on both uh, the American study and the Chinese study, we have extended uh, using lytics and also thrombectomy. So it's uh, not just the lytics, but uh, what we're doing now is we're triaging patients because the greatest risk with using uh, the clot buster is really... A hemorrhagic, uh, what we call a hemorrhagic expansion of, of stroke. So we don't want to cause a worsening situation by using a lytic. Uh, but the reason why I bring this up is because some African Americans will go into an emergency room and uh, they will have what's called a wake up stroke. And 10 years ago, when you had a wake up stroke, they could not determine the time the stroke occurred. That is no longer a reason why we exclude people getting thrombectomies. And so there's strong data that actually shows that you will do a perfusion study and you look at the core infarct or look at the amount of brain tissue that has been affected and look at the surrounding area. And by, based on the way that CT scan or the perfusion study looks, they can actually triage patients so they will have less chance of complications and have more chance for recovery with either uh, doing a thrombectomy. And it is amazing. This uh, takes uh, just uh, minutes to do, but you want to go to a comprehensive stroke center. And so that's the most important part of this. And I think the standard of care is pretty much accepted in most communities except if you're in a rural-based hospital or you're in an urban setting. Actually, being in an urban setting might be your greatest threat because some hospitals will 
want to keep you there and they may not have a neurologist that's covering the ER. That's actually what happened to my brother. So without going into too much more detail is that he saw an internist in the emergency room with a dense um, hemiparetic extremity and the nephrologist says, but a CT scan is negative. That is not a reason to stop pursuing whether or not someone has a stroke. So um, I, I thank you for covering this because this is an area where I think we have uh, asymmetric understanding and it's an area where we have probably the greatest disparity. And I actually looked at this a while back and the percentage of African-Americans who get thrombectomies, which is really important for recovery, not just lytics, but thrombectomies, uh, is so small compared to what's happening in the general population. So thank you, thank you, thank you for covering this. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Coombs. Appreciate your input. And Dr. Maxey, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lawson and Dr. Sherrod have hands up as well. Okay, let's, let's introduce him. Uh, Dr. Dr. Lawson? Yeah, I want to, uh, again, thank you for calling the, the risk factors for stroke. Um, Many uh, many primary care providers and others are now giving the PHQ-9 and GAS routinely uh, to measure whether or not the patients have depression, um, anxiety, but don't often don't recognize that these are also major risk factors for stroke. And what um, they also don't recognize is that it's important when folks have chronic anxiety. I see folks walk around with a badge of honor and dealing with institutional racism. So. Uh, of course, my I'm going to be anxious. So I'm going to be um, um, depressed. And uh, well, we found that folks that not only have anxiety, we have folks that have uh, exposed to um, post-traumatic stress disorder, about a third to half of the patients in many of our clinics. And these folks, not only do they run the risk of psychological consequences, but they run the risk of physical consequences, which include stroke. And unfortunately, um, they self-treat themselves with what we call comfort food. And comfort food is what I say, comforting yourself so you go to the grave because a lot of that food they react with is, well, you know, I have to go out and, and, and comfort myself with some, um, uh, with some apple pie and some bread pudding and um, lots of biscuits with gravy, so forth and so on. Um, but over time, they're increasing their risk for all kinds cardiovascular complications, but they're saying, well, you know, I'm dealing with the, this, my personal depression and distress, so I don't have to worry about it. So, uh, so, so I think it's, and there are now studies showing uh, that African-Americans facing stress are much more likely to become involved in doing um, this, I would call it destructive behaviors. In addition, you mentioned drinking. Um, also, there's a heavy use of substance abuse. The um, cocaine epidemic seems to be as uh, over for the time being, um, but I still run into young people. And again, we look at age range and see some 16, 17 year olds having stroke because they have a cocaine habit. So you gotta remember that dr illicit drugs themselves are also an important risk for stroke as well. And in terms of what to do about it, well, a lot of folks will say, you know, you're depressed, you just sort of live with it. Um, you, they don't do Tai Chi, they don't exercise, they just sort of hang out. When in fact, you don't have to do Tai Chi or other um, extravagant things, just uh, walk a little bit each day. Uh, if you don't want to walk outside, walk up and downstairs, walk around the house. Um, and spend just a few minutes meditating. You don't have to go into deep meditation, but get a, a, a calming book um, to read. Or just um, look at the sunshine. Stick your head out the window and get some sunshine sometime. And it'll work wonders in turn. It may help vitamin D, too, to help um, um, get yourself in a, 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 a quality place. So just, just um, really emphasize that when separating the mental part from the physical part is a mistake. We need to keep these two together in order to have better health outcomes. Are you saying occasionally mashed potatoes and gravy can be good for you? I'm saying <laughs> I'm saying, <laughs> saying them barbecue ribs, that's the other thing. I'm glad somebody brought up the salad. I just, you go to the restaurant and look at the carrots, 
sometimes the salads, dressings, the salad has more calories and more carbohydrates than barbecued ribs. <laughs> So, <laughs> so thank you. So, so read the right. reading reading the label. Dr. Sherrod is is up. Dr. Sherrod, can we unmute her? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, want to thank you all again for a great uh, informative session. My question is regarding um, one whether there is any data since the pandemic on the prevalence and incidents of stroke, because we know that both the COVID virus from COVID infection and the COVID vaccines, one of the side effects has been problems with clotting, um, major clotting uh, episodes. So I was wondering if there are data looking at whether the prevalence has uh, changed or increased. And secondly, are there recommendations for people who have had COVID or the COVID vaccine regarding stroke prevention. And I say this because I just lost my dear cousin, uh, Dr. Rome Sherrod, to a massive stroke with complete clotting of the middle cerebral artery. He actually did have COVID early on in the time when there was no treatment. So I'm just wondering, uh, are there new recommendations for patients who had COVID or who've had the COVID vaccine because I had also a uh, medical student classmate who actually after the vaccine had massive clotting in her lungs though. So I'm just so, wondering if you have any data on that. That's a very complicated question and the, it's a moving target. And why don't we curate a program in the next few weeks and gather some of that data. But I can tell you both the, the disease COVID-19 itself features clotting uh, itself. The vaccine also has potential clotting, but it's much less. But let me get the exact figure so I don't mislead anybody. We'll put together a program on that. Unless uh, Dr. Hines or Dr. Walks has a comment on that. Okay. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. Let's get final words of Dr. Hines and then Dr. Walks. Just wanted to, uh, again, this as a comprehensive review of something that um, affects a lot of us and then this, the, of the factors that we can control, right? There are the things that we can, the things that we can do. We know a lot of them, um, but I think Dr. Lawson brought up a really good point about the way we use some of, some of those things, sometimes the barrier to us exercising or changing our diet or quitting smoking or, or moderating our alcohol use, that kind of thing could be in our um, untreated uh, mental health issues. So just something else to, you know, just wanted to bring that up again. And lastly, FAST, right, is the acronym. So facial drooping, uh, arm weakness, speech changes, and it's time to call 911. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Dr. Walks? Uh, thank you, Dr. Maxey. Uh, this, this, again, is something that uh, we, we can continue to revisit as long as it continues to be an issue. Um, there, there is... What is what is sad, a part of this that is especially sad is that so much of what we talk about, we can control. And since Dr. Nabrit Stevens is not with us today, I'll just talk about how important it is to work with the babies and the children with respect to what we teach them to eat and how we teach them to behave and getting involved in the schools as our children go to school so that they learn the importance of a healthy diet and good exercise. Because it's kind of hard to get folks at a certain age to stop doing the things they've been doing for 30, 40, 50 years. But if we can begin to recognize how important the parts that we can control is. And I know people that, you know, they say, well, I'm working out every day. So, yeah, but as soon as you work out, you say, oh, I just worked out and it made me hungry. And there goes 3,000 calories in right after we work out. You cannot outrun your fork. I've said it many, many times. There's Unless you are an Olympic swimmer, you cannot out-exercise what you eat. And so it's really important for us to recognize we have a lot of control over these things. 
we can make them important within our families and we can change these numbers because if we work with each other and uplift our community with education and with habits, I think we can make a big change. Thank you so much. Uh, Simon, uh, can you tell our audience about a problem we're having with uh, our mailing list? And I want everybody to be encouraged to send us their name and anybody that they want invited. Simon? Yes, um, we are rebuilding our mailing list um, to make it more efficient and actually get people who are going to engage because we're going to be doing some different things going forward in the future. So um, I sent out an email with that link. I also put one in the chat. I can post it again. Um, share that with anybody who wants to be a part of this going forward to come and log in and hear the information and participate with everything that we have going and coming up. And we need everybody to do that. Even though you get an invitation, we want to build this list from scratch. It's very important going forward. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Have a great and safe day. Good day, everyone.